Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, celebrated Nashville studio drum, Near Z. And now, Rich Redman. All right, what is up, rock and rollers? That's right, we're clapping today. We're happy to be here on a happy Sunday coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. This is another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show. We talk thing, we talk about things like music, motivation, success, lots of drummers. If you guys are a fan of the show, we've got like 137 episodes, and it's about time we get this character on the show. He's a friend of mine hailing from Jerusalem at, via New York City. And the last decade in Nashville, Tennessee, world-class drummer, our friend, Nir Z. What's up, Nir? How are you, man? Great to see you, brother. Good to All see you, good, man. man. Oh, dude. All you know, it's good. Like you got We're the keeping red warm. warm. <laughs> it's yeah. keeping warm. Yeah, we had the snow. It wasn't really a white Christmas, but we got like a white post-New Year's. Well, that was pretty weird, right? 71, yep. 72 degrees on Christmas Day, wearing a right. T-shirt. And a week later, we have the snow. It felt yeah. like New York all over again. You know? Yeah, Nashville weather is uh, quite unpredictable. We definitely get four seasons and a million things in between. But hey, if people haven't heard of you, they've had their, they've got their head in the sand. I mean, because look at this. I just want to level the playing field. If people aren't familiar with you, Genesis, John Mayer, Billy Squire, Chris Cornell, Blake Shelton, Josh Stone, Jason Mraz, the list goes on and on. I mean, people can hear you on the radio, on the hour, every hour. That's got to feel good, man, realizing your childhood dreams. Well, it does. I got to be honest. Sometimes I need to remind myself. <laughs> I really do. Right. Uh, you know, in our profession, it's always waves. It's always big waves. And, and, and you get to those moments, especially during Christmas time, the end of the year, beginning of the year. Sometimes, you know, you wonder, all right, what is it coming up for us, you know, <laughs> and is it over? You know what I mean? Because things are moving so fast right now. Right. Y you know, it's like you drive your car, you hear a song. Hey, this is number one by so-and-so. You listen to it. Well, oh, shit, I'm playing on it. But then yeah. a week later, you drive your car. <laughs> there is a all other song number one so it's like okay it's like almost like uh it's so it's moving so quick and hopefully trying to keep up with it to be honest there is nothing else you know yeah you know what they're saying they were saying i don't know who they is the press uh, i heard it from somebody but they said that we're going to in society we are going to advance more technologically in the next decade than in the last hundred years and I could, I mean, I could see it, you know, through this stuff. I mean, Absolutely. this stuff, I'm, yeah. I'm so afraid Absolutely. of Siri. I'm so afraid of Alexa because they're like listening at all time. And I don't know if you saw that movie, The Social Dilemma, but it's scary as heck how they're creating this virtual profile in us. And when I say they, I'm talking about the, you know, big companies and all the big marketers and all that kind of stuff. And there's no privacy. And, and just imagine what's going to happen. You know, we had to go through this file sharing madness, you know, with, you know, Lars Ulrich mad at the world. And then next thing you know, yes. we're in this situation, you know, with the Spotify's and the Pandora's. It's good in the sense that we have the entire history of music for $10 a month. But then also it kind of right. like took the sexiness and the mystique out of music where we're, we're not reading liner notes. All these records that you're on, the only way people are going to know is if you tell them. Right, because there's no liner notes. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you you've said it dead on. Uh, we lost the mystery. There is no mystery anymore. Meaning, uh, and I'm sure you remember, even when we used to listen to vinyls when we were teenagers. Right, you had the cover of the vinyl, the cover of the record. Right, that's all you had. That was the entire information. Yeah. Everything you needed to know was on this square cover of the vinyl. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to know more, so you'll go to the magazine store, 
you might get a Rolling Stone magazine or right. any other music magazine, but it was so limited. Now, and, and it's kind of bittersweet to me because you listen to, some, to something or someone or whatever, one click on your computer or your, or your iPhone, you know everything about them. Yeah. And what, I mean, I hope it makes sense because you listen to the music, the song, whatever this is, you had an image, you had some kind of fantasy that you built in your own self. Yes. And then one click, and many times you regret you did this one click because I had complete, I had one idea and now I get the information from A to Z and it's a all different thing. It's a all different persona. It's a all different machine. It's a all different everything. And that to me, uh, that's the mystery I miss. Yeah. You know, the unknown. Yeah. You, you know, it's like, we, you know, we're talking drumming, bro. Come on. We, how many yeah. times we talked about it? You know, when you, as a teenager, you used to listen to something. You wanted to figure it out. You had to listen to the record over and, and the over beauty and, of it, yeah. over and over again. And the beauty of it, you came up with your own interpretation of what is it you wanted to learn. And that's yeah. how you became your own self versus going on YouTube now, one click. Yeah. The person will show me step by step, step yeah. by step. Yeah, totally. Right? Yeah, you keep seeing these like young lions, you know, these kids that are six, seven, eight years old. And you're like, oh, my God, something is in the water. Something is changing. Maybe it's the steroids and the poultry. Like, what is going on here? Because these kids are like, like playing so well. And maybe it's because the, the material to learn things is so accessible. So they're learning and their skill set is advancing like at an insane rate. Now, this is something that we don't know. Is that six, seven or eight year old kid? that's playing Tom Sawyer, um, are they going to have the persistence, determination, and tenacity to fly over a body of water, move to the Big Apple, start grinding from the bottom up, go to Nashville, reinvent right. themselves, find themselves in their midlife, right. be able to hear themselves on the radio and call themselves a survivor. You don't necessarily know that, right? That is like, that's the gumption. That's the sweat. That's the, the things that the blood all the things that you had to give up in your life to maintain this career moving forward, it really is, um, it's commendable right. as a middle-aged guy looking at another middle-aged guy who both, we both have fondness right. for, for the color black. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We, uh, absolutely. We've been there yeah. and done that, man, and we're still doing it. So, so if there's ever a day that goes by that you're like, man, where is this going? I think that a lot of us are going to have occasionally those same thoughts but man, we're survivors, man. We got to give ourselves a hand. We got to pat ourselves on the back. We got to go get a good cigar and smoke it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because it start, I, you know, it's the biggest argument, if, if you like. I, I don't, there is no shortcut. Yeah. There is no really, there is some things in life in general, especially when we hit 50, mm -hmm. thankfully we're healthy and we're still standing and we feel great. But you get to this stage and you realize there is no shortcut. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're 10 year old and you can play Tom Sawyer from A to Z without, a mis without any mistake. It's great. I'm not yeah. saying I, I appreciate it. You know, I Me respect too. that. But where are the days when we used to go out and play gigs in front of four people, setting up our own drum set mm -hmm. and not even have any idea? I know back in New York, not even any idea, you know, whoever was the leader of the band or the artist, whoever put this gig together, literally count in and you have no clue what you're about to play. Right. You know, and that's a all other part of your brain that develop over the years that in my opinion become really numb if you're just looking on videos all day long 
Yeah. And X or Y, you or me or anyone else showing you exactly how to do it. Yeah, right. that's the technical part of it. But what is your, where is your artistic response to the right. music in real time? And we loved it. Yeah. We loved schlepping our drums. We loved setting up our drums. We were proud of them. Oh, yeah, I remember, absolutely. You know, and, and then like, oh, my God. And that feeling of like, I don't know what's going to happen on this gig, but I'm so excited about it because I've prepared. Right. I've got an open mind. I'm ready to grow musically. And maybe somebody is going to walk through that door that's going to see me do this and go, hey, kid, come here. I got a great gig for you. I remember being that guy, you know, playing in the clubs in Dallas, Texas. Um, and saying like some guy is going to walk through that door and take a liking to me and just grab me and scoop me up. Now that never happened. I had to be forward thinking and say, you know what? I'm going to give my band in Dallas my comfortable position. I'm going to give my band two weeks notice. I'm going to move to Nashville, the great unknown coming up on 25 years here. You're on year 11. And you, before that, you had this deep musical thing that you did in New York city. Um, but it was just such a terribly exciting things. And I hope that live music doesn't go away. I'm hoping things come back because this last two years has been really emotionally and mentally hard on so many people. It really oh, has. I so, mean, ab absolutely. And, and just for the record, you've said really, you've said great things right now. I mean, everything you described going back to you back in Texas. Yeah. This is the thing. Have the balls to leave your comfort zone and challenge yourself because you could be in your hometown, your country, whatever this is. You get into yeah. this comfort zone and you create this routine and you look, you step out and, hey, I'm pretty comfortable. But it. it's just going to roll over and over again. It's going to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And have the, the courage to say, okay, in order for me to move on, I need to start from scratch elsewhere. Yeah. This is stage one. You know, this is stage one. And according to the live shows, I honestly don't think, even though I don't, you do more, more than I do. I mean, I'm mostly in the studio, even though I love the stage, I miss that, you know, it's yeah, you went out with Billy energy. Squire, and who else did you went out with Genesis, and you went like you did some touring over the years. In Billy there. Squire, Genesis, uh, a little Steven, Steven Van Zandt. Oh, great! That's cool. Steven Van Zandt from oh yeah, that was amazing. Was that during? Uh, uh, oh, remember, that was yeah. later. That wasn't during the Sopranos. That was like a couple years back, right? Yeah, that was before pandemic. Yeah, that was that's before right. the I, pandemic. It was like 2017, was 2018. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even, yeah, 18, 19, something 18, like that. 19. Yeah, yeah, I remember um, that. But um, back to the, uh, I'm sorry, back to the live shows, you know, I don't think we're going to lose it. Uh, and, and I truly don't think we're going to lose it because people still want to watch you on stage, want to hear live music. Right. And I know the last couple of years in Ectic, it's still, I mean, still it's like there is a dividing line there. You know, it's very fragile. I don't know what's going on with you guys. Did you cancel any shows? Uh, no, we... we well, only two shows got canceled. Only two got canceled. And we did a, quite a few shows. And it was such a gorgeous thing because when you go, you know, nearly two years without seeing, your, you know, your best friends or playing those songs or getting that visceral reaction, that firsthand right. interaction and communication with a crowd, which is, is like a drug to us, it really can mess with your, um, you know, right. your identity. And of course, I, I remember like watching you go through the challenges of music row, you know, during the lockdown and Nashville seemed yeah. to forge ahead. It's like, Hey, we're the songwriting capital of the world. And we got to get these, this product out. People still want to hear this stuff. And you yeah. having to go to sessions and mask and distance and all that kind of stuff. And, and oh yeah. Coming Absolutely. through the other end. We did. We did. Yeah. We did all that. And, and it was like everybody else, everybody went through, this experience in different ways, you know. Yeah. I, I got very lucky. You know, we passed the first two months, if you remember, with the lockdown and all that um, panic, which totally makes sense. 
And then I start getting a lot of phone calls to track drums remotely because I right. have the environment here, yep. which was cool. But I got to be honest, um, okay, I'm making a living, but at the same time, I got very depressed because I want to work with people. Yeah. You, you, you know, and, and it's like I find myself here. You don't even get to talk to people. It's all via text. Yeah. <laughs> you are the engineer, you are the drummer, you need to make the call, you need to like, and it really upset me. In one point, it really upset me because, man, I need some interaction. Yeah, I need somebody, someone in the room with me to tell me, hey, man, this is great or this is shit, okay? Because then, yeah, then you can get caught in your head, and you're right, because you're, you're producing and engineering yourself in a room, and the only feedback is you sending like a rough MP3 to somebody, and the songwriter's like, you love it. Uh, snare is a little low, and can you be less busy on the bridge? And then you give them another track, and then they're happy, and then exactly. there's your money, and you're working your craft. But there, there isn't a bass player in the room with you. You're not getting the feedback through the glass. There's no coffee no, breaks. Nothing. Yeah, no, there is none. There is none of it. And and, and again, I appreciate the I appreciate the circumstances that I develop this environment, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to do it. But like I said, you get to a point where you need this interaction with people. And yeah. thankfully, many artists, as you know, old tools got canceled. So, okay, what is it we're going to do? Mm -hmm. we, we well, gonna, we, let's record music. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. I, I think a lot of people that, that are curious about the, the music machinery that is Nashville could be surprised to know that, you know, drummers that have been around for in Nashville, maybe three, four decades, um, you would oh, never think least, that they yeah. would play single scale or play on a demo because they enjoyed the velvet rope era of double, triple scale three times a day for mm -hmm. 10, 15 years, but you still want to keep doing this and you have to roll and adjust with the times. Some of these guys are playing for $180 on a demo, you know, on the card mm -hmm. or um, the interesting part of having your own room and being your own engineer and your own kind of like businessman is you can put your own, essentially your own dollar value on a track. And um, yeah. I actually charge more than I would. I'm just, I'm sure you do than what you would get if you signed the yellow card. And that's kind of exciting and inspiring, but- Absolutely. The, the trade-off is no other humans are in the room, <laughs> you know? And, and that's, that's right on the nose, bro, because yes, you actually, if you look at the industry of the music row industry, most likely, unless you do the master records, which thankfully yeah. I get to do, Yeah. Yes, you make more dollars doing it yourself, you know, in your own room. Yeah. Um, and it took some time to build it because I literally, you know, I built this environment, like even the setup, the gear in here, there yeah. is like just the microphones collections in this studio. It's like any other professional studio in town. Sure. Well, yeah. Let, let's put it this way, you know. And, and on and on and on and on and on. The, the old chain of the, because the gear does make a big difference. Sure. You, so you yeah, know. for the, for the, uh, for the folks that are, that are just listening to this um, and not watching this, Nier is set, set up in front of a beautiful drum set, professionally mic'd. It's got sound treatment in the room. He's flanked by tons of drums and percussion. And this is happening yeah. in all the music cities. You're, you know, your New York's, your LA's, Absolutely. your Atlanta's, your Miami's, your Austin's definitely here in Nashville, Tennessee, but it, but it's exciting, man. And, and like I said, it goes along with the idea that you're a thriver and a survivor and a thriver, but take us back. Like the idea of like 
taking a uh, taking a massive chance, leaving the comfort and security of your homeland. Now, your young, your younger brother is a successful drummer in Israel. Um, he yes, stayed. he's absolutely one of the top, top, top notch guys over there. It's in your blood. It's in yeah. your it's in your family. So what? What yeah. was the, how old were you? And what was the tipping point where you said, I need to go to the big apple? Was it a circumstance that came to you or was it a circumstance that you created? No, it, it wasn't. It was something in the back of my mind, to be honest, since I was a teenager. You know, like any other teenager musician in his own town. Okay, when I was a teenager, we lived in Tel Aviv area already. Mm. We, we moved from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv area. I mean, with my parents, the family. And there is some wonderful musicians over there, by the way. Incredible musicians. I'm sure. Especially for the size of the country. You know, when you break it out, it's like, wow, that's pretty impressive. You know, a lot of talents. But it was always in the back of my mind, that after the service, I had to, you know, in Israel, we have to serve in the military. How was that experience for you? That, that was a tough one. That was a rough yeah. one, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, imagine somebody is pulling you off your basement, taking your drumsticks away from you when you're 18. It's like, hey, wait, dude, this is all beautiful. I know you love playing the drums. You're going to wear those uniform and going to join the service, you know. That's here, here's, a, here's a machine gun. Here you go. Yeah, yeah, here you go. That's literally black and white, as I described. But did you feel like it helped you grow as a person? Was it two years of your life? Absolutely, because it's the circ three years. um, It's the circumstances who, you know, changed you. Yeah. Because it's a whole different... It's all different world. Yeah. You become a soldier. It doesn't matter what is it your dreams or what is it you want to do, especially in my time. You know, this is your duty. This is part of your responsibility for your homeland. And yeah. I don't want to get politics here or anything yeah, like yeah. that. But, you know, it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very complex, it's a yeah. complex place, you know. So... Right after that, I was very lucky that one of the, he literally was the biggest artist at that time in Israel. I'm talking the guy who was like the guy, okay? And one day he wanted to change everything and he he kind of told himself, well, I got those 25 A guys, musicians around me. I want some new blood. You know, it it Mm -hmm. really was like that. And I can't even remember how it started. I, like you said, I played somewhere, some club, another club. You know, I was a kid. And a friend of this artist got to see me playing in some club or whatever. And the rest is history. And I'm getting a phone call. One day you get a phone call from like, at that time, imagine, it's like you're getting a phone call from Springsteen. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, this is, yeah, the Michael Jackson like, of Israel is calling you. Yeah. It, it, it's like, I, I would tell you it was more like Springsteen than Michael Jackson, but doesn't right. matter. <laughs> right, right, right. And then it become, and I jump into the scenario, I jump into the situation I wouldn't, I, I cannot tell you it was as easy because it was really challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've learned very fast and he was very tough. He believed in me, but it wasn't easy on me. Okay. Meaning. But it's, it's so good to have those early taskmasters in your life that are like, you're rushing, you're dragging, you're too loud. You didn't learn the song. Ex- exactly what you were just talking. I don't give a flying. I don't give a damn how fast you can play a paradiddle. Yep. If you can't hold a tempo, I, you're going to be in big trouble. Yes. I need you to be in the pocket. I need you to groove. I need to be consistent. All the other You are consistent, brother. You are consistent. But, but I, I got to give him the credit. He was hard on me. I had days, bro. I never actually talked about it. Now I can tell you. 
<laughs> it was so hard on me that, you, you know, that I got to a point where I moved. I remember practicing with the song, with the songs, literally took away all the toms, took away everything, kept the kick drum, snare, and hi-hat. Yep. And just played and played and played some with, his, you know, some with the music that I was supposed to play or some great records that we all listened to, you know, and wouldn't even let myself, I wouldn't let it interrupt me if there is a field playing or some changes like. You just play just through. Play through, stay in the pocket. And there is a stage that you need, there is the, this stage when you hit the wall that you need to break. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, because as young kids, you and I can understand now, you know, when you're in your early 20s. You're like, this guy's, uh, I'm his beating you're waiting. You're waiting for the action. You're waiting for like moving around and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But as time moved on, you realize the beauty and the joy of just staying in the pocket. Yeah. I hear that foundation in your playing. I mean, all, there's all sorts of other beautiful things that blossom around that, but there is this extreme foundation of the consistency of the quarter note and that commitment to that. It's like, I'm not a big Tom guy. I mean, I dig it. I listen to all the fusion stuff, but you know, for the most part, we're going to be playing sucka dooms. You know what I mean? It's like, so in pop, you're going to yeah. be playing sucka dooms. So yeah. I love practicing without the Tom sometimes. I still do it to this day. Turn, turn on Motown and just play the groove. Playing the groove and enjoy it and find this center, find this sweet spot where not only, you know, the stage one, oh, oh great, I, I can do it. I can just play the groove. But the next stage is to be able to breathe and really enjoy it. I mean, mm -hmm. let's go back. I know people have heard it so many freaking times. Yeah. James Brown. You listen to James Brown. You listen to Bob Marley. If you really analyze it, it's a loop. A human there is loop. There's a feel here in there. What's that? It's like a human, like, it's a human loop. Like, like think of a human that, loop, uh, of course. That of James course. Brown song, think, 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 I mean, that thing ain't moving. That's that thing is direct from Africa. Like think, 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 I might be think, 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 think. That is Africa re just manifesting Absolutely. itself. And and I gotta share with you, man. I when I lived in New York. And that was different. That was a different New York. I remember that was down in Soho. Can't remember what street it was, but there was bunk, there was like I don't know three guys, four guys who literally on the street just played soul music on the corner. On the corner, you know the typical New York. And I can tell you, the guy didn't have a bass drum. He had what did he use? Hi hat, a hi hat, and a snare drum. Wow, that's really brave because there's no way to ground the. No, one. but you know what? You closed your eyes. If you close your eyes, you turn around. You could feel the bass drum. Just the way his interpretation was, with his his accent as and his ghost notes and like. And I remember I came across those guys at least three, four, five times, God knows. And every time I went back home and it got me sick, I got so confused. Like, how in the world? Okay. This guy made it feel so. And honestly, honestly, I don't know who the person is. Just like, there were a bunch of guys from the Bronx used to take the subway down to the Soho set up tiny amplifiers, play for the old sing, you know, old sing. And until that moment, 
the very first time I got to see those guys, I would never think you can make it feel so good without even a bass drum. Yeah. Incredible. You, you know? And and that's actually taken to the next to the next level. Yeah. So you, you know because this this cat that that was that was so tough on you that was your first gig that probably saw the greatness in you and then doubled down on how hard he was on you because he just saw the greatness in you. So do you, is he around? Do you keep in touch with him? Have you ever thanked him? He actually, yeah. I mean, over the years, even though years later when I was living in New York, he flew me over there. To, I played on a couple of his records and stuff like that. Um, and, and again, I, I thanked him later on because he was extra tough. Let's put it this way. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was so tough where... Man, back in that back in the day, we got to record on two-inch tape machines. Okay, this is yeah. pre-Pro Tools. Yeah, I remember that. You, you know the deal. It was extra tough. I gotta say. I mean, to the point where if there is a backbeat, there is the the click. It's not even a flam between the backbeat, you know, your backbeat snare and the click. It's almost there, you know. It was like, we need to punch that. Wow. Yes, it was to that extreme. It was, I, I, I got to say it, it was very extreme. Wow. Well, I, I could see that I, being very helpful in your training. Yeah, and, and it was, you know, and, and I believe he's still active, he's still making music, but... I think he mellow, mellowed out, yeah. you know, um, because at that time, by the way, a lot of those kids out there are not aware of, this is, was the time where they had those, uh, what's the, what was the Yamaha drum machine? RX-11 or something? I had the RX-7. Seven? seven? The 80s. RX Remember seven. it was on... It's, yeah. It was a great drum machine, right? I still, I still got one here in the garage, and I love it because it had all the individual Seriously? outs on the back. It looks super cool, and all the buttons were like they, they clicked and clacked, and they, and then the digital yeah. readout was the same monochrome readout as the coffee machines at Blackbird. So if you feel like the coffee That's, machines at Blackbird uh, uh, have the uh, same uh, technology uh, uh, as this drum machine, and we paid thousands touch. of dollars for this thing. Yeah, yeah. I still have it. I yeah. loved it. So what was when you yeah. moved to New York, you're in the military, right. you do your service, you get some training, you come to the Big Apple, and then eventually, I'm sure there's a whole litany of, of events that happen. But a lot of people like to lean on this, you know, everyone has like a little bit of a claim to fame. And so people say, well, let's get this cat because he played on the first John Mayer record that was like exploded mm -hmm. into the world. He played on the first Jason Mraz record that exploded in the world. Mm. Oh yeah. And he's got this Genesis thing in his bag of tricks. And wow, he had played a couple on a couple songs on the, was it the uh, Chris Cornell's uh, euphoria morning? Was that the record? No, no, I did all record with Chris rest in peace. Um, that was uh, carry on. Oh, carry on. Okay. But, and so you I, go back I, and I played on his, that was his second solo record. Right. That was Chris's second solo record, uh, which uh, Steve Lillywhite produced. So you have this relationship and with we, Steve Lillywhite, and so the call comes through him for to play on that record. So it's a relationship. Uh, you know, yeah. to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I was, uh, it was a crazy rainy gray day in New York City. And then phone rang. I didn't recognize the number. I picked up. Hello, Neil. This is Steve Lillywhite. And uh, he was living in New York at the time. Right. And few people recommended me. And he basically called me up. He goes, would you, uh, would you be okay to come to California and work on the next Chris Cornell solo record? And I was like, wow, are you kidding me? And the rest is history, you know. Yeah. Went out there, um, got to meet um, Chris. 
we spent, there was uh, like three legs of like 10 days each time. So we had many hours, many days. 30 days to do a record? And then they, no, no, no but, but I'll, ex I'll explain. We do that. We're going to get to it. I know where you're going. <laughs> I know where you're going. It's just like every time he wrote some extra songs. Mm. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And, and therefore, they just wanted to, they could afford to take this journey. It happened twice that I went back to New York and I was sure we finished the record. And two months later, I get a phone call. Hey, can we go back? There is a few more songs. So honestly, I don't know how many songs we cut, but they kind of, you know, if it was 20 songs or whatever, you know, they picked up 12, 11, whatever, and this, this was the record. Uh, but at different times, but there was totally different, different times. times. Now, so yeah. Lily White, he was a producer. Did he end up doing like Dave Matthews and some big, huge oh, acts, right? Coldplay, you two, you two, Matthews, all this stuff. And and he's uh, and and what I think is great about Lily White. It's funny because I literally. I do some production here when I did some, I produced three songs on this girl in my studio. And I realized more and more how much she influenced me. And what I mean by that, the beauty of Little White from the first note is mixing the record. And I'll give you an example. If we're talking drumming. Right. Okay, this snare drum sounds good, okay. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's not my vision, but we can tweak it later. No, in his case, pick the right snare this first. Is, this is the drum. Oh, this is the guitar tone. Oh, this is the bass tone. So he, he literally mix the music as you go. You know, and it's a, it's a completely different approach. I mean, can't compare it to the way we're doing it, yeah. you know, these days. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's yeah, great. Man. You're front loading. You've got, he's already got the vision and he's, and he's willing to commit to that thing at the front end instead of we get a little lazy because we have so much technology at our fingertip. We're like, oh, well, if it's not perfectly in tune with the track, we'll just add a sample. No, Chuck, the, you know, all later. So like I could I could totally see that. Now let, let's talk about this. Probably the thing that probably when you first come to Nashville, I knew you knew some producers that championed you, which is great. Whenever you have somebody that champions you, you're going to this, through this life change. You're like, well, at least I have this lifeline, a couple of people that are going to call me and then I'll do a great job for them. And hopefully the, this, they're like, this is the John Mayer guy, you know, um, that, that song that was all over the radio that I played a million times. I'm like, this drummer is, he's slick, man. This is like, I'm not hearing a lot of crash symbols, little, the, the symbol, the crash, uh, the crashes that you did play weren't overplayed. They were just little glimmers of glass. Like the snare was always perfect for the track. Not a lot of toms. It was like, this is, this is good, man. This is good stuff. Appreciate that. Tell us about yeah. that, that, that process of working with John. I mean, did you know it at the time that this kid was going to be a huge star or were you just giving your Abs best? Like you always absolutely. do. Yeah. Th this is, this is the funniest thing because I have witnesses um, a dear and who was that bass player was, that played with you, man? Um, uh, I saw David Labwear. Oh, that was David. Labwear. Okay, yeah, man. And Dave, he moved to Nashville too. Player. Yeah, he's in Nashville as well. Yeah, everybody yeah. end up here. That's right. I think you know. I think it's going to make sense to you. The beginning with John Mayer was. I know some of the people in the industry at the time were like, well we don't need another Dave Matthews. We have Dave Matthews. And if you think about the songs, you can easily, you could really take it in that direction. All these funky, chunky guitars, all this kind of stuff. And pretty quickly, that became the challenge. Okay, how can we bring something different so it would not sound like a Dave Matthews wannabe kind of project. Mm -hmm. Now, 
f just a note here. I love Dave Matthews. Those guys, I mean, they're unbelievable. I mean, Carter is, is an unreal drummer. I mean, I yeah. could never play like this guy in a million years. Sick. But he's a sick musician. So right there, that was the challenge of how you're going to simplify everything. Because if you really go back to this record, Room for Squares, we really try to keep it in the pocket as much as we can. You know, near um, going back 20 years, are you still happy with it? The choices you made, or I haven't, I haven't listened to it to be honest with you, but I haven't listened to it in a, in a long time. I yeah. enjoy, I still get some messages from young kids, literally anywhere from Brazil to Australia. They will send me a video where they play alone with one of the songs. It's awesome. Okay? Yeah. And it's very cool because some of them, I really enjoy to see that some of them have their own interpretation. This is where I'm going back to. They didn't get to see it. You know, there is no like video out there showing you, hey, this is how I played it. They listen. Right. Yeah, you know, and many times I said, and you're going to get it. It could be a ghost note on the rhythm guitar, literally a ghost note, that you can mistake it as a hi-hat hit. Or a ghost note on the snare. Or a ghost note on the snare. Or oh, all these tiny details. And I always love watching those guys. They pick this up as part of the drumming part which yeah. actually wasn't the drums. Right. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. So it's cool. But totally. yeah, man, I'm, I don't really, I mean, I think most of us, you don't end up, you don't listen to your own records. You know, you just don't yeah. listen to it. You kind of, you move on, you move on. It's yeah, I, li I listen like when it comes out because, you know, as you know, in Nashville, we're moving so fast. Like, Absolutely. We're usually cutting one radio hit every 90 minutes. And I'm not patting ourselves on the back because the songs are so writ so well written. We know what to do. Yeah. And then we just have to execute. So then, but then months go by and the product comes out and I'm like, and then immediately you remember the coffee and it rained that day. And oh yeah. And such and such was on steel that day and not such and such. And yeah. you remember it. And it's just, I like to at least experience that moment one time before I have to like scribble out a chart, no, go on to rehearsals to, to go play it live, you know? Um, but that was just such a great record, man. And I'm telling you, it does hold up. That. It's amazing. And then the Jason Mraz stuff. I remember sure. being in a band. And the lead singer was like, man, have you checked out this groovy ass shit, man? This guy, he's like, he's, he's kind of yeah. like a white pop rapper. Um, <laughs> great stuff, man. You know, great stuff. And I thought that I all was, the, sna uh, yeah. the snare drums you chose near on all the songs, like your the snare Too drum sure. choices are immaculate. And am I right in saying you've been with GMS and um, Gretsch? and now sonar but at the time was gms sonar. was it not that was gms yes i actually punchy played. ass bass drum man it reminds me of man, eric kretz from of, uh, stone temple pilots if you ever listen to those records and you're he like played, the bass he plays he plays gms yes it's he like does. that kick drum you could you like you're a foot away from it it's amazing to be honest those guys remain friends and um Sadly, still in business? we moving. I think they somewhat in business, and we move into a whole different topic here. Yes, sorry, man, I'm all over the place. But no, 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 that's fine. That's a legit conversation, you know. Uh, that was a tough, tough move because it got really difficult for them to give the support. Yeah, sure. The small companies very difficult. You, you need it. Yeah. Very small company, great people making great product. When I moved to Nashville, this is few, few, I don't know, three, four years later into the 
Nashville scene, I realized, man, it's really difficult for them, you know, to, to, to support you as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to a point where, because if you look at my endorsement career, I know it's, it, it's really, for the amount of years, three companies. Pretty good. Pretty good run. It's, it's, it's pretty good. I, I, kept, I kept loyal as long as I could, you know, mm -hmm. and I love them all. I got nothing but good things to say about them all, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and we're both Sabian guys, you know, and that's a wonderful place to Sabian, be. Sabian, yeah, you and I, we've been with Sabian forever, uh, you know. And, um, yeah, so it's just, to me, it's always very difficult. It's the worst thing to say to someone. I always said to my friends, it was easier to break up with a girlfriend than telling your drum company I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know it sounds terrible. It's but, right, right. Doesn't mean I mean I'm a married man for many years, but I'm just saying it's just like. But yeah. I I've learned it took me a long time to learn. You know, it's business, it's business because sure. it is. What what can you do? It, it just. Oh, yeah. But uh, you know the point being that the, whatever drums you were playing, you always sound great. I mean, those records sound. I appreciate unbelievable. I appreciate Everybody check that. out the first. I, John listen, Mayer. I I I believe that any drummer. Any player who's been playing for a long time, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, let, I'll put you behind different drum kits. You're going to sound like you. It's yeah. going to be Rich Redmond playing the drum set. It, it really yeah. doesn't matter. The secret is out. Let's be honest. Everybody makes great drums. Yeah, they sure do. Everybody you can get a great drum set for 600 bucks now. <laughs> you know? the, yeah, those $900 drum kits. You know, when you were 14 years old, if someone would give you this drum set, you would be like, oh, my God. Yeah. So even though they make it in China, who gives it there? Yeah. You know, if you tune it right, they actually sound very good. Oh, man. I always tell the kids, hey, Pearl Export. You put some fresh heads on a Pearl Export, it's going to sound amazing. And then don't even get me started about what's happening with the you know, DW design concept, PDP kits with the wood hoops. You're like, this is an amazing instrument. And I'm, I'm well under a thousand dollars here. Pretty incredible. Exactly. And so I know that Sonar is doing great. I was with Sonar for a decade. I left Sonar, went to DW. You left Gretsch and went to Sonar. Went to Sonar. Well, yeah. here you go. It, there we are. It's the same. It's a circle. Yeah. They're all making great drums. And, and with the gear, we got to a point now very interested because people we can move on you know talk about gear you're going on sessions and i would say i'm thinking you know with drum paradise who are doing a great job setting up my gear i would say there is i don't know 12 15 snare drums yep now let's be honest how many you really need now they all well, here's the, Yeah, well, here's the deal, and it doesn't even matter what the what the maker is because everyone knows at all the companies that yes, you have to have a home base as far as a company, but then in the studio, you know, all bets are off because if you like the sound of something and the producer digs it, you're just going to use it. So, what would be? What are the three drums like? If I'm thinking like if a if a Ludwig Acrylite can almost cover everything. But say you want to have three drums that are like cover the high thing really well, they cover the mid thing really well, and then the low thing really well. What are those three drums that are getting used the most? Uh, you just say it. A lot of the Ludwig classic drums, as we know. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, every company out there almost making, they make a substitute. Yeah, right. Their version of it is their version of it could be there is a dw kind of black beauty version or there is a, a, a pearl or sonar or whatever uh there is um any changes every few years give you an example i got this uh crazy heavy duty 
sonor it's the it's their version of the bell brass it's the ah, um, nice the capo yes it is extremely expensive drum the weight is like i can't even tell you weight like a kid 30 <laughs> 30 35 pounds yeah 35 pounds drum but i gotta tell you um it happened literally right before the new year. I had like three weeks of hectic schedule, like session after session. And, and I had the same comment from a few engineers that I know and I worked with them for the last two years, right. maybe last 10 years here in Nashville. And they all said to me the same thing. Every time I put this sono, this snare drum, like, dude, how could you hide this from me? Where was this snare drum all these years? You right. know? So here's an example for a drum. Hands down, tune it high, tune it medium, tune it low, tune it any way you like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, always, always does the job. Always nice. bring that one drum. Looking for. Yeah. That's one drum. Right. Um, but in general, uh, so I got this one, got the vintage series of the, the Sono vintage series. It's just a five and a half by 14 wood. It's a beach shell. Nice. Um, incredible, really incredible. Uh, that's all I can say. It just, it just sounds good. It doesn't <laughs> matter what is it you need. Right. Right. Yes, I do have, yes, I have the Black Beauty always on site i have the aqualite got you know i just got an early 1920s like i need another snare drum yeah you treated uh, yourself when you got went to nelson drum co and you got yeah uh, you felt like you needed to support a local business I was owner buying, yeah i was buying i was buying time not to visit this store but eventually <laughs> eventually i went down there i still haven't done so, it man but i remember when he had the store in his garage and so like i'm overdue i'm and i'm, I'm so happy that his business is going well Oh, he's great. they great over there. I, yeah. I, I don't think he was there. What's his name? The owner. Uh, Bryce. Bryce. I, he wasn't Bryce there when I went. I think it was two guys who worked for him over there. Um, yeah. No, it's a wonderful. Listen, like we always said, we're talking gear. How many more snare drums do you need? Just one right, more? Right, right. You know, okay. Yeah, it's always time to kind of like thin the herd because, yeah, I think like I'm, I got all these snare drums here. I got all these snare drums on the road. I got all the snare drums in Jason's locker. I got all the snare drums in Los Angeles. I got all the snare drums, you know, and, it, and it, it, it many times does come down to like three or four that you're like, these are just the most requested. They are the easiest to fit into the mix, you know. Yes. Um, yes. But, but at the same time, I got to tell you, I had many scenarios where – I'll be in one session on Monday and the producer will say, don't touch it. I love this drum. This is the snare. Excuse me. Uh -huh. the, next, the next day I'll be in a different studio with a different producer. Yep. And right away he's like, man, I don't like this snare drum. I Just know, I hate give that. Give me You're, something different. Yeah, one room's got but, 30 foot ceilings and you're like, it's killing. And the next day you're in a room with nine foot ceilings and it doesn't work. And this is where we get to the point. The room, you really need to, a tip to any studio drummer, especially drummers, because we depend on the room. Right. Be aware of the room. Sure. It, it, it just, it's physic. It's physic. Like right. I know even in my own studio, you know, which is about, I would say, 500 square foot, mm -hmm. maybe 600 or something. It's about 12 feet high. It's a pretty good nice. size room. Nice. Looks great. But I know for a fact, yeah, I mean, I use some snare drums. Um, I use it in Ocean Way, of course, and it sounded amazing. I bring it to my own room and I'm like, what yeah. happened to you? Totally. <laughs> you know? Totally. So uh, you got to be, th there is no, 
uh, you, you got to be very flexible and you got to be aware of many, 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 many things. Yeah, the music, the producer, scenarios. the room, the mics, the engineer everything. that day, everything, yes. Every time and many, many times, you know, I came back to my own studio. I watched an engineer using a particular technique with whatever, uh, room microphones, closed room microphones. And I listened back and like, man, I never thought about that. It sounds amazing. And very excited, go back to my studio, do the exact same thing. Yeah, right. And it sounds like shit. <laughs> because my room doesn't, you know, my room doesn't sound the same. Right, so, right. you know, it's, it's just like, and, and this is in general. We get Trial and error. Back to players in general, we all individuals, for better or worse. You kind of... You get ideas, you're being influenced by people and so on and so on. And, but be honest with yourself, meaning like look at the mirror, open your eyes and, and really look at this. Okay, this is who I am. This is like, this is my sound. This is my style. This is, you know, and develop that. I'm not yeah. saying don't listen to others. Definitely listen to others. You hear something you like try to play it you know obviously yeah. but develop your own self sure because hey well i i mean i notice your your style is um it's so the groove is so deep you have great hands extreme dynamic control um i saw a video it's older. I mean, actually, you're dressed like I am. I'm dressed today, but it's of you playing this track called Alaire, and it's on. Uh, it's for like Tune Track or something, and you're playing some. I yeah. think they're electronic drums. And they the are. Track that is, was when we put on. It's killing, man. It is killing. And then you then you get the solo and something as simple as like taka taka taka. You know what I mean? That fill the like the machine gun it, and you that that that. that all the stuff, you know, it just makes me think about, oh, you can play this rhythm and it doesn't have to be all the same. It's great, man. Great. Uh, sadly, which sadly, when we did Superior Drummer. Yes. We were promoting this and all they said to me, they sent me this drum set at the time. Tune it, tweak it, play along with the Superior Drummer samples, right? And I wrote this piece of music on Logic Audio. Wow, it's killer. It's like, a, hear. it's like a Tower of Power track with all the stabs and hits and stuff. Yeah. It's awesome. Everything, everything is there. But uh, I'm still looking for the track. And I'm afraid that I lost it. Because oh, I don't write. It's there. I mean, I need to get someone who can actually write the notations and the arrangement. Ah, yeah. Okay, I had this vision and I spent a couple of days and, well, I guess this is where we played music for the sake of music also, you know, I had the time yeah. to no, it, it. Well, it's on the internet, Nir. I mean, if people look up Alair Jam, you know, Nir Z, I mean, there's not enough, yeah, there's not enough of you on the internet. There needs to be more video of you on the internet, you know, but I, well, I found I mean, that. We talked, like, we talked about that. I appreciate it. We, we talked about that. I, a lot of people telling me, man, I'm just looking for being honest. It's not an excuse. It's just having a family, having, you know, kids. Yeah. And I also find out that, okay, when you put something on the internet, I find it like, because there is so much material sure, and sure. I respect them all. There is so much material. It's like, okay, am I time of two minutes drumming that you heard before or anything? You see what I'm saying? It's like almost need to justify, you know, okay, what is it I can give you today that you haven't heard or give you some mojo well, to sit behind yeah. your instrument and practice you, you, well, you know yeah and i know i need to do more more of that because it's part of the business also yeah well I'm i would encourage you because do you remember um 
2016, you were a guest teacher at my drummer's weekend in Nashville, which is, was, yeah. uh, you know, it was like pre-COVID. 2016? 2016, you were playing Gretsch. You had a, you get a Gretsch kid. That's how long, oh my God. Yeah. And the kids wow. loved you and you play along the tracks and um, it was just that really, was really day. cool. Yeah. And you're a natural educator. So if you ever want to expand and keep growing that, I think that there's definitely things there. And what's great that separates you from the other guys that maybe like teach drums at the community college or, you know, the 5A high school, um, Mm -hmm. what's is the fact that you have a pedigree. It's like first John Mayer record, first Jason Mraz record. And then what, like, what? what are some of these things that you've played in Nashville that you're kind of proud of? A lot of Blake Shelton records, right? What are the big ones that you've done in the last 10 years? There were, there were, there, there were a lot of records actually in Nashville. There is uh, all the Dan and Shay records. And Dan okay. and Shay right. are doing Dan and really Shea. well. Yeah. And Dan and Shay kind of broke the, the rules here a little bit. Because even sonically, if you listen to the last record, sonically, it's very different from a lot of the national records approach wise meaning just an example you really get to hear this high high pitch snare instead of the big fat snare that you hear on a lot of blake shelton records so yeah um there is very like kind of funky grooves over there there's some cool stuff so all the dan and shay blake last four records or that's awesome michael, see michael, yeah michael ray okay michael ray Michael Ray, some a lot of Lee Bryce stuff, a lot of the uh, I don't know Jordan Davis, uh, Dustin Lynch. Oh, nice! Uh, yeah. uh, a lot of the girls out there. I'm so sorry. Did you play it on uh, the the track "Seeing Red" for Dustin Lynch? It was a number one. Seeing Red. I, I don't know. If so could have been I about six years so. ago, but. Kurt and Tully wrote that song. That's why I was wondering, you know, my buddies, Kurt and Tully and our band wrote yeah. that song. It was. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So. And that good, yeah. man. And, and, I, and, so. and a good amount of girls that um, Low and Elena. Farn Elena. Low and Elena stuff. And, she's uh, fun. I like her. She's a great girl. She's a great girl. Uh, we're doing right now. Um, matter of fact, uh, Tyler is the. Half of the F- FGL band, Tyler. Oh, okay. Uh, Hubbard. Yes. Uh, so we started this before the end of the year. I think we're going to continue this month. Um, trying to remember, there is a lot of names, but I honestly forget. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, <laughs> I'm honestly sure a lot of it's forget. on allmusic.com. You know, which is where you can yeah. kind of you can kind of look up. Yeah. You know, for the kids out there that want to look up. So you can create your Spotify yeah. playlist and play along and stuff. Since liner notes don't exist anymore, you just go to allmusic.com. You type in Nier's name and there'd be a lot of these offerings on there. Then you can go on Spotify, check these things out, really kind of get into his style Thank and you. study, you know, his sound coming through Genesis. When you did the Genesis thing, Phil wasn't the singer, right? Was Phil on a break no. or something? Ray Wilson. That was a guy There was a band named Stillskin in Europe. Mm-hmm. And if you listen, for a matter of fact, I just did a solo record with Ray during pandemic. I nice. need to send you the link. Yeah, thank God the name of the band different. wasn't Foreskin. Yeah, no, it was this skin. Hit and me a symbol, Ray. Hit, hit a symbol for yeah. me. Man. <laughs> yeah, Ray is. Uh, I honestly, and I'm not the only one who says that. Even Tony Banks will say it. If you take Collins and Gabriel's voice and blend them together. This is Ray. Yeah, he sounds great. Um, he's a singer. You know, it's like, it's a all other level of singing. It, it just, yeah. this guy just need to, um, you know, there is people out there like, they like sing. Chris Cornell. Yeah. Oh, one of a you, you kind. Know, I mean, they, it comes along every 20 years, yeah, right? Someone they, like that. Exactly. When, when, exactly. When they open their mouth, it, it's like, it's just undeniable. Um, yeah, so that was a great experience, man. It's the last last century, really. Um, <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, it is crazy. I mean, it's it crazy. Is to- it, last it is totally crazy. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so when I you were coming to- up, yes. I don't. I don't really do 
you know, because so many interviews are chronological. You know, how'd you get in the drums? Did, who was your first teacher? Who were your influences? When did you move to New York? We just kind of go around. It's and I want and I wanted to know before we end this conversation. I wanted to know who your influences were, and then who was your first teacher? Did you have a teacher? Uh, yes, I did. And I mean, um, have, there's I no way teachers. you can have hands and read and do all the things you do. I think without with being self taught. Oh no, I, I had uh, my very first teacher. Thankfully, he's still out there, and I need to contact him. Yes. He was, uh, he was extremely musical. Very, very, very musical. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, I remember when he told me all those rudiments and all that stuff, quickly would move me to, you know, would move to the drum set. And he always created those scenarios where we're going to have a conversation right now between the floor tom and the rock tom. Just an example. And he always talked about the, the tribes in Africa thousands of years ago when, when they used to communicate yes. to one another. So the floor right? tom is a tribe and the high tom is a tribe. Exactly. And it took me years to understand how unique this guy was. Yeah. We used to sit down and he would play me records of all the greatest, anywhere from Elvin Jones to Blakey. Jim Krupa yeah. to Max Roach, Blake, you know, all the classic stuff that you are aware of and really forced me to listen deeply into the musical part of it how to make it, how to create a story. Yeah. You, you know, and I remember it was very frustrating for me as a young kid. I was 12 years old. Yeah. But as time moved on, as time moved on, I, so I was, that was about, we lived about, this is right when we moved to Tel Aviv area, which is, was about 30 minutes from Tel Aviv. And then about three years later, I moved to, which my first teacher wanted me to do so. I moved to the next teacher, which he was the master in the country. His name was David Rich. Hmm. David passed. He passed almost two years ago. Hmm. Um, I just lost was, one of my teachers. Horrible. You know, you know how it is. But David was one of the first students of Joe Morello. Oh, wow. You, you see what I'm saying? So now I'm getting into, I'm getting into a whole different. It really, the experience was actually really studying with Joe Morello through David. Right. You, you know, uh, so yeah, those were teachers now did you get to play it's some straight ahead teachers. in your early days did you play some straight if ahead I played, like growing if I up what's we like straight ahead oh Stang, that was bang, like. they that was i thought that was my future i was about yeah. to go into the dress world that's how i studied you know i worked on it so but, much uh, too man i feel so rusty oh man it's all different. And, and you watch those guys today, they touch and the way they, you know, brushes and, and the swing. It's, well, it's a different lifestyle. It's a different lifestyle. Yeah, the lifestyle is attached it's a to it. Different, different lifestyle. The lifestyle is attached, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. any of those guys will sit behind your drum set right now. I don't know, whatever you got set up as Rich Redmond drum set, and they will sit behind my drum set right now. It's probably going to be pretty different for them to, you know, the touch, the tuning, the symbols. It's all different animal. It's a yeah. different instrument. It's a different instrument, you know. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Now who's, uh, and then who were the, who were the guys that you started going, Oh my God. Like for me, it was like, 
Stuart Copeland, Alex Van Halen, you know, it was like those cats, you know, Terry Bazio with missing persons, like, dude, I'm going to do yeah. that with my life. So who were there like, was there like a couple of cornerstone guys, a Mount Rushmore group of guys? Very, very, all of the above, all those guys you mentioned. Yeah. But you know, I grew up in a place in my time, we didn't have the access to watch all those guys like if you would live in the United States. You guys get MTV so, or no? We had MTV, but mm -hmm. when I'm talking, be able to go and watch a show yeah, and, and, and get to see someone like Terry Bozier right in front of you actually playing. Yeah. I remember first time I got to see him was in New York. When I moved to New York, finally I got to see him. It was, it was insane. The, the whole experience was like, Dude, are you kidding me? I mean, yeah, it's like this is a human doing this. And, he, and yeah, I still feel like he's so actually, young. I mean, I think Terry just turned 70. I mean, you know, when you start thinking about it, they, they seem mm. so much more older and godlike when you're a child. And then as you start to age, you're like, oh, we weren't we're not that old, uh, too far apart. No, I, I, absolutely. But, you know, back when you're asking people who really uh, because I guess it's, it's the circumstances I was very much into jazz as a 14, 15 year old kid. Mm -hmm. And here is VSOP, Tony Williams, Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, the Giants are playing in Jerusalem. Awesome. And of course, I'm going to see, and to this day, I remember the freaking yellow Gretsch kit on stage. You know, he had this setup, right? Yeah. And, and, bro, I think I went into a complete show, shock as, as soon as they stopped playing. Until that moment, I had this, this is jazz music. It's very light. It's very soft. And there is rock music, right, which is in your face. In that stage, I missed the old center in between the two. And of yeah. course, world music was out there. And I remember when I, Tony Williams went on stage and he literally, I remember, he was the one who started. He just started swinging. And, you know, he always started those open solos. And I was in shock. The yeah. power. Yeah. I, I, An I can't incredible imagine. jazz like, drummer. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? With the power, I never, I never seen anything like that. Yeah, and Cobham, and a, like, and Billy Cobham, same thing. Woo. Uh, yeah. So it's a all other. And then I moved to New York, and I went to see, and I got to see Kenwood Denard. Oh yeah, singing and Kenwood playing Denard keyboards with his left hand and playing drums. Playing at the, same the keyboard time. in his left hand and play at the same time. Uh, it's just like. Um, that's another guy who, who literally took many hours of my sleep. Like I could not believe it. I remember to this day how he played, went to some tiny club in New York and he was playing one hand, the keyboards on the left hand side. And I remember his hi-hat stand being, because he's very powerful. So, you know, he plays with his left foot and the hi-hat stand is moving away from him and he would drag the, the stand back with his left leg with his left foot but would not miss a bit wouldn't miss a note and no, later on when i got to meet him and i realized the guy is deaf he's literally deaf on yeah. one side right yeah and but you know it's a whole other you know, those are the things that I know maybe some of the kids out there now listen to this conversation. I'm afraid they're not even aware of what we're talking about. Well, everybody look up Billy Cobham, Kenwood Denard, Terry Bozio. Please do. I mean, Terry Bozio, Kenwood Denard, Tony Williams. Oh, my God. Gene Krupa. Go Gene all was my, Gene way was to my Gene guy. Krupa. Dean was my guy. Same here. I mean, yeah. Joe Morello. 
-hmm. What a musical drummer. Elvin Jones, obviously, you know, Art Blakey. You know, I know we're repeating the same names over and over and over again, and it maybe sounds like a broken record. But you know what? Those kids out there, I think it's really important to understand where it started. Yeah, and because it's such a young is, instrument. I mean, we're looking at an instrument that's about 100 years old, right? Can you believe that, all the things that have happened? That's pretty freaking in, amazing. Isn't that crazy? That we're looking at just a little over 100 years old, starting with, yeah. starting with vaudeville musicians. And it's like, oh, one guy's sick today, so we need to find a way to create this thing so the snare drummer can play the high, the, the cymbals with his foot. Yeah. And then let's create this thing so that same guy can play the bass drum at the same time. Budget cutbacks, right? They're already there. Right then, the drummer was being put in the back of the room like, hey, we're going to pay you the same as everyone else. We want you to do three times the amount of things. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if some of those kids know that some of those records, because I still get to work with a legend Nashville producer, I think I mentioned him to you, Brent Mayer. He's almost 80 years old. I didn't know he was that old. Wow, okay. Yeah, he's 78, 79. You mm -hmm. know, he's up there. He's, by the way, no, he, he's great. He's in a great shape and everything, but... Yeah. And he worked on so many records. And hearing the stories, how they even recording, obviously, live probably they had eight tracks, pushing the drummer to the end of the room or finding the corner in the room physically just to balance between the drum set and the band. There is no monitors at, the same, at that time. There is not like you really need to listen. This is no, this is a way before, I'm not talking in ears, I'm right. talking there is no really monitors. Everybody okay. had to mix themselves from the floor. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying not ta don't take advantage of technology. We all use in-ears. We're all using all those toys and all this luxury. But I truly believe for any young player, if you go out there and really research, go back to basic to, again, understand and listen how it happened, how it's been created. I think that would be a great education journey for any young guy who wants to play this instrument. Yeah. Other words, this young guy, the next time he's going to see someone like, and we have an amazing players, obviously, today. Like, if you really educate yourself, the next time you're going to see Jojo Mayer playing drums, you're going to appreciate him even more knowing the history. Yeah. Understand the journey, like all the way from Gene Krupa and early guys, all the way to someone like Jojo Mayer, for example. I'm just throwing a name of someone we all know, which is incredible. Um, yeah, like... That's really what it is. You know, the sing, sing, sing thing. I mean, it's like everybody in my family loved the big band. I mean, my grandparents used to dance at the Savoy Ballroom to Chick Webb and all these guys and the Gene Krupa Big yeah. Band. And of course, my dad loved, you know, if you listen to the theme song to like the sitcom 30 Rock, that's Sean Pelton doing Gene Krupa. And absolutely. You and got to have way, these. You just mentioned, I yeah. love Sean. I love, I know Sean for years in New York. I love him. Well, you know what's so funny? And it, when, when I got to do it was never the great, it was not the best circumstances to play the show. But when I finally got to play the show, here I am, I'm set up three feet in front of Sean playing for millions of people. And in the backstage area, he was so kind to come backstage and be like, Hey brother, I just want to let you know, man, I'm a big fan of what you do. And you're putting out the education for the kids and man, yeah. high five. And he didn't have to do that. It was so cool because we have that fraternity oh, he's of, awesome. uh, of, of drummers. And the, and the first time you got on my radar, was because I'm dear friends with Sammy Marandino and Sammy Marandino would always go oh, see you Sammy. play and be like, Hey man, 
you got to check out this dude near. He goes, he goes, I love him and I hate him because he's got perfect time. I said, perfect time. Oh. Come on. <laughs> perfect time. He goes, he goes, this guy has perfect time. Is so deep. That's and I'm like, funny. Oh, I love Sam. Yeah. I love Sammy. I I've, I've stayed, stayed at his house a million times. Um, yeah, he's a great yeah. guy. He's yeah. a great guy. He's a great guy. Great well, friend, bro, friend. I mean, I, I mean, you definitely back to what Sean telling you, and this is not because we're talking. I mean, I really admire the journey you've been taking in long time right now. This education wow. thing, it's pretty oh, impressive. So, oh, and thanks, I mean man. it. It's it's very impressive. I. Um, it just because I know life, you yeah. know, we all old enough to know life. I can just imagine how much it takes, you know, to to stay on it and build it. So, oh, thank you, brother. Bravo, well, hey, brother. Thank you, man. And bravo to you. And hey, if somebody did reach out to you and said, "Hey, can we do a Zoom lesson?" Like, are you open to teaching kids? Well, I haven't. I had few people did it. I, I mean, they reached out, and um, and I haven't done it to be honest. But yeah. I might do it here and there. Yeah. I might do it. I um, I think it's cool. I I, I just put it. a bunch of tea towels I, on the drums, and 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 I just go because that way. I mean, you can go through your DAW and you could submix and everything into the laptop, but for for those kind of things, I just put tea towels on the drums and I put up the low volume sabians you know and then i could just literally like this go into the laptop and change the really so you yeah. can hear it though do you can yeah, actually I mean, hear it you can Meaning, if, if you yeah if you don't use your daw and you go um just want to use the you know the microphone on the laptop it's totally going to distort if you don't modify the sound of your drums a little bit so that's i do the ringo thing and put the tea towels on there what do you do? You use the in, the earpods for it or no? Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's like Mac no, really but, has uh, a great but the drum. mic. Yeah, but the mic is the earpod mic. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So when you sit behind the kid, that's what yeah. they're getting. Yeah, and there's tons of ways mm. to submix. I mean, I bought during the pandemic. I went out and bought all the zoom 4k cameras and i have the video mixer and i have all the lighting but i just i haven't really set the whole thing up because sometimes it's just so much easier just to use the laptop the ear pods put the tea towels on the drums and 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 they're picking up your voice they can see the drums change the angle a little bit you know if they need to see something you're where is your little. where is your drums over there oh where, my drums where are, is the drums I got my drums and my snare drums and oh, and the, that's great! Yeah, it's all kind of. I'm in the same room. I've got same like you. I've got like a six hundred, five six hundred square foot man cave, and I get to do my podcasts. And I'm surrounded by percussion and snare drums. And you know, um, the only thing different with us is that my workflow is around you know my drum tech Johnny. My does all my engineering. So right, at least right, when I'm here, right. I have another human being to say I. Man, I, let's 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 use a different snare drum, you know. So at least there's still a thing happening right there, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, you guys I, that I are doing all the this. file management and everything, woo! That's a lot of stuff, man. It's impressive. It's a lot of men. Many times, even just the setup, even what you see behind me, people assume, hey, you got your, you're always ready to go. You got your setup, but honestly. Mm -hmm. Many times I need to redo the setup because different producers want different things. Yeah, somebody might want the Vista lights. Somebody might want the dry concert toms. N not know. only that, but, you know, but the, the drums, it's easy. You put, you know, you change the drums, but they want different miking configuration and they want. Now, once you change, even once you change the overhead microphones, everything changes. Yeah. It's just the nature, it's the nature of the beast. You know, you move the room microphones here, you move this microphone over there and so on and so on. And you find yourself spending two hours on, on drum sound. Yeah. And, and right now, um, for those who into engineering and stuff, I don't know if you can see, but there is more microphones than you actually need. What I mean by that, 
Nier is showing us his space. It's amazing. So, so you've so got other what options you see, ready to go. Like, if you look up, you have two telephone can left and right on the overheads, left and, you know, widespread. And in the center, you have a stereo ribbon mic, for example. Right. So you have four overheads microphones. The reason is, and those two are complete apple and orange. They all great. Mm -hmm. So I got to a point, this producer likes, he likes ribbon mic as an overhead. This guy likes pencil microphones as an overhead. Mm -hmm. And I find myself spending so much time switching here, switching there. So now I'm recording everything. Oh, wow. Gotcha. You see what I'm saying? I'm sending mm -hmm. about 20 microphones. Wow. But, by, and we're not talking a huge drum set, probably the same setup you play. Yeah, it's a four you know, piece it could kit. Be maybe two four piece kit, just, or maybe an extra floor. Maybe, maybe an, an extra floor. floor. Okay. Right. That's it. But I try to cover for time consuming, give them all the options in the world so you can blend whatever microphones you decide to blend and get the sound you want to get. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, and that took some years really to obviously buying the gear, buying the microphones and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so this is, this is how I do it. This is how I work, you know? Yeah, um, it's, it's great, man. It's great. Well, I love your story, man. You know, um, wait, bud. The, the pedigree of New York. Thank you. And then you're, you're already coming up on 12 years in Nashville. Amazing body of work. Everybody check out allmusic.com. Look yeah. up near. Thank you. Put your, put your Spotify playlist together. Play, play along to his stuff. And at the very least, go back and check out the second Chris Cornell record. Check out the first John Mayer record and check out the first mm. Jason Mraz record. And you'll get a great sense of what he's got going on here. The last four Blake Shelton Thank records, you. all the Dan and Shay, um, the Lauren Elena. That's a good cross section of, of uh, Nears musicianship. And um, man, before Appreciate we split, it. if somebody wanted to do this and they want to move to Nashville and they want to do the thing, what do you tell mm. the kid? A couple of points of advice there. They're 21 years That's old. You got me. Yeah, you got me the million dollar question at the end of the <laughs> at the topic because well, it happened a lot recently. Yeah. Um, would you agree with me before I actually answer that Nashville right now in 2022, yeah. we're actually in 2022, is very different than what it was in 2016. It is. It is. More studios it's have different. closed. More condos have gone up. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there is thankfully there is studios, but there is definitely more condos and more, you know, traffic. <laughs> uh, become a little bit of a city right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say to any twenty-one year old who moves to Nashville right now who wants to do the thing, whatever that thing is. Yeah. Take every gig you can possibly take. Yes. And do it the best possibly way you can do it is like your life depends on it. Mm -hmm. And be patient. That's really what I can say. And be yourself. Be you yourself. Know, because take every gig, do a great job, have a smile on exactly. your face, and, um, and be exactly. patient. Yeah. Be patient because it's a journey. And, uh, but always remember, anything can happen. You might play it on a, a Broadway show for $50, you know, $50 gig. Yeah. And somebody will walk in and spot you and will change your life. You never know. Yep. yep. You've got to believe. You've got to you believe this to is believe. what you did. You did it. I did it. We're still doing it even though we get a bit older and more realistic and aware of how crazy this world is, but this is what we do. This is our mission. Totally. And you what's know, the so best way to, um, for people to contact you? Is it through um, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or email? Uh, email? Email, my email. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, it, it's like, you know what? 
the reason I'm giving my email out because yeah. it's easier for me to keep track on, of everything. Yes. Because it happened to me that people send me a, a message via Facebook and I find out a year later. Oh, it, you, you see what I'm saying? So sure, it's sure. just like, it's very simple. Near Z, N I R Z at Mac.com. N I R Z at Mac.com. You guys heard it here first. Awesome. Yeah. So you're making yourself. Near Z at Mac.com. Making yourself. And, making, and, the, yeah. Making yourself approachable to the kids because you did it, man. You did it. You're a success Appreciate story. It, brother. And hopefully we've got another uh, 25 years. I wanted to die with the sticks in my hand. I know that for a fact. Man, I really appreciate your time, and especially on a Sunday, buddy, and I look forward to seeing you soon, man. Great fun, bro. Yeah. Great, great fun. Thank you so much. Hey, to all the listeners out there, guys, we appreciate you. We encourage you to rate and review, subscribe, and share. It spreads the word. We're talking about all things music, motivation, and success. Man, I appreciate it here. Happy Sunday. We'll see you guys soon. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.